Okay, so uh, we're doing support vector machines, which is another uh, means of classification. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to look at the maximal marginal classifier, the support vector classifier, support vector machine, and multi class cases. Um, okay. So the maximal marginal classifier in hyperplane. So basically, um, hyperplane at the very, very simplest case is simply a line in a two-dimensional space. Um, if it's 3D, then it is in fact just a, a 2D plane. Um, okay. Uh, then, um, so we can use a, a hyperplane to separate our points. Um, so we have to consider the dimensions. We have the number of observations times the number of features. Um, and we want to classify our observations as either being one of two groups. So here's an example from the book. Um, so we have our purple and blue points. So you want to classify them into two groups. Um, and on the left, we can see that there are a number of different um, hyperplanes that could actually successfully um, separate them. So the question this algorithm attempts to answer is which one is the best? Um, and so the first approach was the maximal margin classifier um, that basically just goes through and says, okay, what is the largest separating, um, like what is the line with the largest separation between the two classes? Um, so we can compute the perpendicular distance from each training observation to the hyperplane. Um, and the smallest of these distances is known as the margin. Um, and then the maximal margin hyperplane is um, the hyperplane in which the max the margin is maximized. <laughs> um, and we can classify a test observation based on which side of the margin that point lies on. Um, and so here's a visual representation here. Um, so here we have a purple point. This is saying this is the last purple point um, before our decision boundary in black. And it has, the algorithm has maximized our distance between that decision boundary. And then we have two blue points as well there. So this is our margin on the blue side. Um, so, Constructing M and C based on training observations, um, so they have an optimization problem, um, and uh, the constraint ensures that each observation will be correctly classified as long as M is positive. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the maximized margin classifier, though, is also sensitive to outliers between the two classes in the data set. So while this is typically a good approach like at its first glance. Um, if you have outliers in the data set in the blue or the purple groups, um, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to actually create a hyperplane that um, completely separates the two groups. Um, and so there's a stat quest. I guess it did not embed. I don't know. But um, so essentially, um, we, uh, so yeah, StatQuest was really great. Uh, talked about like uh, basically like the outliers problem and then goes through explaining a hyperplane. Um, hey Ricardo, did, is this supposed to be like embedded here? Cause I followed the, I, be, I believe there's a, there's a library. I, I used it in, uh, in the tree base uh, models chapter eight. Okay. Uh, there's a library that lets you uh, embed here. the video and it shows you the video uh, there. Okay. Maybe if you, uh, you know, later, if you can go to chapter eight, mm -hmm. you will see the, you know, the embedded video, but, okay. but it's a library. I think it's called the embed, embed something. Oh, okay. I'll check that out. Yeah, I saw this one in chapter eight, so I just grabbed it, but I also realized my URL looks slightly different. So I might've grabbed the wrong URL for me too. Right, right. I, I, at least, you know, in the last request, you know, that I did with John, uh -huh. I went, you know, I, I believe it went through. Okay. okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, so support vector classifiers, um, oops, I guess I forgot to un underline that. So um, 
we can't always use a hyperplane to separate two classes. So here's an example, right, where we've got clear um, outliers for our purple group, and here's one for our blue group. So no matter where we try to draw um, our hyperplane, it's it's going to have a misclassification. Um, and even if such a classifier does exist, it's not desirable due to overfitting um, because it's too sensitive to the individual um, training data. So it might be worthwhile to consider a classifier that misclassifies it, misclassifies view observations, um, but that would make it um, more generalizable for the test data set. Um, and so um, again, this relates to the bias variance um, trade-off where we're going to include more variance, um, but we're going to have less uh, bias going forward. Um, so the support vector classifier, aka the margin, the soft margin classifier, allows for some training data to be on the wrong side. Um, so the SVC classifies a test observation based on which side of the hyperplane it lies. Um, and then it includes uh, this cost, um, this cost parameter, which is a non-negative tuning parameter, um, and it's typically chosen through a cross-validation, um, such as like tenfold um, cross-validation. Um, and then E is a slack variable. ES is a slack variable that allow individual observations to be on the wrong side of the margin. Our hyperplane. Um, an EI indicates where the ith, uh, ith observation is located in regards to the margin of the hyperplane. Um, so note that C greater than zero, there's no more um, C observations can be on the right side of the hyperplane in this case. EI yeah, equals one, uh, so there's no, okay, so right. So basically um, if you have no cost, then, um, then that margin is gonna be really, really huge because there's no penalty for all of the misclassifications. Um, but as C gets larger, um, that cost gets larger for misclassifying one of the two groups and therefore the margin is gonna be a little bit smaller um, and have fewer points on the, on the margin. So for example here, um, this is a really uh, uh, low cost because again, it's just basically saying like, oh, well, if this margin is really big, then we're, <laughs> then, you know, it can, it can basically misclassify all of these points. Um, and then here, as we have the cost increasing, um, wait, yeah, C decreases tolerance for the observations being on the wrong side of the margin decreases. Um, oh, wait, hold on, did I get that up backwards? C decreases the tolerance for the observations being on the wrong side of the margin decreases and the margin narrows. Why is that? Oh, okay, I did get it backwards, sorry. <laughs> Um, and, um, and so the property of the classifier is the only data points for which the, the, for which they lie or violate. The margin will affect the hyperplane. Uh, these data points are known as support vectors. So like here, um, we have the blue points, this purple point, um, and these two little purple points. So these are going to be our support vectors. Oops. Okay. Um, but in real data, um, our support vector machines, uh, they may not, um, so in, in real data, the relationship may not always be linear. Um, and so, um, that's kind of where the support vector classifier, um, with the soft margin, um, begins to fail. And so, um, there is an alternative support vector machines that can actually work with um, this nonlinear relationship. And so here's an example from the book again, where we want to classify the purple versus the blue. Um, but if we were to use a support vector classifier, it really wouldn't be able to separate those. Um, 
Okay, so then the SVM is an extension of the SVC, which results from using kernels to enlarge the feature space. Um, essentially, we want to enlarge the feature space to make use of a nonlinear decision boundary, um, but avoid getting bogged down in unmanageable calculations. Um, the solution to the SVU problem in SVU context only involves the inner product, the dot products of the observations. Um, to estimate, um, was it alpha s? Do okay. So we'll go through this. Um, okay. So radial kernels. Uh, there are other options besides polynomial kernel functions, and a popular one is a radial kernel, um, and it's a positive constant. Uh, for given test observations, it is far from x i. It will be given um, the small, negative, and large. Uh, what is it? do do do? Okay, so radial kernels definitely are a thing. <laughs> Predicted class, mm -mm -mm. far from a given test point. Local behavior with respect to other observations. Okay. Um, so, okay. So the advantage of using a kernel rather than simply enlarging the feature space is uh, computationally uh, necessary um, to compute um, this many kernel functions because um, basically the um, algorithm is comparing each pair of data points to one another. Um, so that is a huge amount of computation if you have to be transforming your data set um, using uh, the different kernel functions um, like the polynomial kernel function um, and the radial kernel function. Uh, and you actually have to um, convert them to the degree of the polynomial. Uh, so the feature space is implicit and infinite and dimensional for the radial kernels. So uh, we couldn't do it anyways. Um, uh, Jenny, can you go yeah. back to that yeah. uh, figure? Uh, yeah, I, I believe that the right one is the one that is talking about using the supervector machines with the radial radio kernel. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me, I, I just you know saw it now, it kind of sort of remind me, reminds me of the KNN uh, algorithm, you know, the, the nearest neighbors. Yeah. Okay. So practically what it's doing is trying to group, uh, you know, components that are similar in distance and, and the similar in, in distance from other groups, just like uh, KNN does. So I don't know if maybe there's a mathematical connection you know, between both of them. I mean, I'm just, you know, speculating, you know, thinking out loud here. <laughs> no, actually, that's that's quite a good point. Um, so yeah, I think actually there is a relationship. I believe the StatQuest went into the fact that um, there was a relationship between these two ideas um, and that they do kind of converge on the, the nearest neighbor because yeah, like it, essentially you've got this radial kernel and it's comparing um, like these purple points to all the points around it, right. which is conceptually. Um, yeah, because some, sometimes you get like, for example, in, in this case, you just a, bi a binary, right? So you, you can see where the group is concentrated and then the other ones. Mm -hmm. But let's say if you have three or more groups, okay, like a clustering uh, type of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you usually what you want to do is try to group together the ones that are kind of near each other, but then try to distance it from, from the other groups, right? Okay, so that, that's mm -hmm. kind of a trade-off. And I don't know, you know, if the radial kernel right now is that, that is what it's trying to do, okay? Uh, uh, apparently from the figure is trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, very neat. Okay, SVMs with more than two classes. Um, so the concept of that separating hyperplane does not extend naturally to more than two classes. There are some ways around this. One versus one uh, approach constricts SVMs, um, where K is the number of classes. Um, an observation is classified as each of the K to two classes, two to K classes, and the number of times it appears in each class is counted. Um, so the data point is classified to the class for which it was most often assigned in the pairwise classifications. 
which I believe again is related to, as you were mentioning, um, <laughs> ahead was a little bit like the nearest neighbor. Um, and another option is the one versus all classification. Uh, this can be useful when there are a lot of classes. Um, so K number of SVMs are fitted and one of the K classes to the remaining K minus uh, two compared to the basically all the others. So one versus all others, yep. Uh, denotes the parameter to do, do, do. And then assign a test observation to the class K for which um, comparing the K class to the others for which I'm going to call this um, sort of multi-class margin is the largest. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so we had the Taito Models uh, lab. Um, so that was, so I didn't actually end up going through the Tidy Models one. Um, I ran, um, I ran the ISLR one that uses the E107. Um, so, although I made the mistake of, so I ran that and then I, I was working on tidy models. So I'm gonna have a few like clashes here. Um, let me see if I fixed at least some of them. Well, we'll get there when we get there. Tune is an issue. Okay, uh, so right, so here, um, so this E1071 is um, the original uh, SVM um, library uh, that was used by ISLR2. Um, and so we start with this simulated data set. We've got blues, we've got red points, we wanna classify them. Um, and we can already see we've got like one red outlier. Um, so like the maximal margin, marginal classifier we know would not be a good choice here. Um, and so uh, then we can run SVM with the kernel equals linear. Um, we just selected a cost um, that's really, really high. Um, and again, so I don't say it backwards. <laughs> if the cost is higher, then uh, there will be fewer points. No, oh my God, is that wrong again? Yeah, it's, 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 inver it's, it's inverse proportional. Inverse proportional. If the, cost, if the cost is higher, the margins are going to be decreasing. Okay. Because you're assigning a penalty, okay, into the, the misclassification, okay? Right, okay, so cost is, so inverse relationship, if the cost is higher, the margin is smaller, okay. Right, so, right. Okay. Okay, right. So then that increases our bias uh, because, right, because then it's closer to the training data set. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm also bad with left and right. I don't know. <laughs> East West, it's a thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know. It, it reminds me, remember the, the linear regularization? Okay, yeah. The, so at the ridge, that, you know, you have to find the optimal, uh, you know, parameter so that you have a balance between the bias and the variance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the same the same here, it's the same, you know, you're going to yes. optimize that C component, yeah. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so here we have the plot, um, which I thought was actually rather neat. Um, but uh, so yeah, so we can hear, so here this uh, jagged line is gonna be our decision boundary. Um, unfortunately, the margins are not going to be plotted um, in this case. So, you know, I'm sure there is a way to do it once you poke around um, with ggplot and things like that um, and kind of get into the, the meat of the SVM fit. Um, so that would be kind of a fun thing to do in the near future. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we can get some information here. Uh, so here we can see the index are the samples um, or the data points for which um, we used on the margin. So these are support vectors. Um, and uh, then we can just look at some basic information. Um, so we use classification with a linear kernel um, and our cost 
Oh, sorry. Actually, wait, then I have that mixed up because, oh yeah, number of support vectors is seven. And then there are four for one class, three in another. So no. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Sorry. Um, all right. Um, so what if we use a smaller cost parameter um, here? And so in this case, um, we have shifted our decision boundary um, to the right. Uh, and, um, and okay, so now that the smaller value of the cost parameter is being used, we add a larger number of support vectors because the margin is wider. And then we can use two. So we want to make sure that we're not just picking um, our cost our cost tuning parameter kind of randomly. Um, and so we can do tenfold cross validation um, using the built-in tune function uh, for this um, library. And we choose a range of um, cost values um, for our parameter, uh, ranging from very small to very large. And okay, so then we see um, we see that we have all our different costs. We have a dispersion, which actually I meant to look up what the dispersion was. That must, and then it's got our error, which I believe is the misclassification error. Um, okay. So we see that cost equals zero one equals the lowest cross valid, oh, it's cross validation error rate. Um, again, I'm assuming that's misclassification error. Um, and then the tune function stores the best model obtained, which we can access here. So we can do our summary, check it out, tells us our cost, the best cost function um, for the ones that we had examined was 0 0.1 um, with 16 support vectors. And then we can use predict. So we have our test data set again, just simulated um, with Y being our two classes. Uh, in this case, uh, just a factor of negative one and one. Um, and then if we want to look at the test data set, um, you know, we have the blue and the red data points, um, and uh, we can try to see how well our SVM or our support vector classifier actually separates our new data. Um, and so it kind of just did summary just to look at that uh, distribution of the values um, that each sample Y um, has. So again, so they can do the predict. Um, and so basically we did a confusion matrix here in the table. So after we predicted which of the test data set are in classes you know, negative one versus one, um, we can see that we misclassified a total of three samples. So here's two that were misclassified. Um, they were in the group one, but they were classified as, uh, wait, predict. so they were negative one, but they were classified as one. Um, and then vice versa for that third one. Um, and then it's got a misclassification error of uh, 15%. Uh, um, so what if we just decided to uh, decrease our cost? So we want to look at the 0 0.1. So we do this. Um, and this time now, again, we have decreased um, decreased the size of our margin. No. Oh my God. I need to just write it down and have it on a sticky note. <laughs> Um, okay, so then we have a larger number of support vectors, but when we look at our prediction, um, unsurprisingly, we do much worse. Um, so this time uh, we have a total of six cases that are misclassified. Um, mm 
Okay, then we're going Okay, so this is kind of where I sort of ended. We fit the support vector classifier and plot the resulting hyperplane. Okay, hold on. Do do do. Which the two classes are linearly separated. We can find a separating hyperplane using the SVM function. We first further separate the two classes in our simulated data set so they are linearly separable. Okay, so then we can create a um, SVM model um, using a very large value of cost so that no observations are misclassified. Okay. And no training errors were made and only three support vectors were used. However, we can see from the figure that the margin is very narrow. Again, because the observations are not support vectors indicated as circles, they are very close to the decision boundary. It seems likely that this model will perform poorly on test data. Um, okay, and then, so yeah. Um, <laughs> and then if we use cost equals one, we misclassify a training observation, but we also obtain a much wider margin and make use of seven support vectors, it seems likely that this model will perform better on test data than model with cost um, being very, very small. Oh wait, no, that's very, very low. So. Uh, uh, okay, so, okay, support vector machine. Uh, okay, right, so next uh, we have to go through into um, Okay, so next we go into the uh, actual vector machine where we're going to use our kernels, so our nonlinear kernels. Uh, we now have a different value of the parameter kernel. Um, so again, in this case, um, we have our simulated data set. If we plot it, um, we can see again, we have just like the book showed, um, we have black and red points with the red being in the center. Um, so we know that we couldn't use a support vector classifier um, with a, a linear um, hyperplane to actually separate this. And then if it's split into training and test groups, um, then we can use the training set to um, use a radial kernel um, to identify uh, which of the classes these points belong to. Um, and so the SVM classification plot here, again, we can see actually the performance is probably pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, we'll see. All right, so, uh, so we use the cost equals one. Um, mm -hmm. At a non-linear boundary, this summary function can be used. So we can see that the cost was equal to one. Mm -hmm. And that there are a fair number of training errors in the SVM fit. If we increase the value of cost, we reduce the number of training errors, um, but it comes at the price of an irregular decision boundary that seems to be at risk of overfitting the data. Okay, so. Again, yeah, that seems like this is probably way overfit and it's only gonna perform well on the training data, as we can see. Okay, so then we can actually do a cross-validation again um, using the radial kernel with a range of um, cost values and a range of gamma values. Mm -hmm. I did not go over gamma. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. 
increasing gamma, we can produce a more flexible fit and generate further improvements. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. So cross-validation has allowed us to um, determine that the best choice of parameters are these two values. Um, and then we can use our uh, training data to actually determine um, what our prediction is. Um, or how well it does here. Um, and then it's 12 of the test valid, the test observations are misclassified by this SVM. Okay, uh, so um, ROC curves are one way that we can use to determine the, um, how good our model fit uh, is at predicting um, and on uh, test data. Um, the package can be used to produce ROC curves. Uh, we first write a short function to plot an ROC curve given a vector containing a numerical score for each observation, um, prediction and a vector containing the class label for each observation truth. Okay, so then uh, we can run our SVM with a radial curve again, with our radial kernel again. Um, and, uh, and then we can look at our decision values. Mm -mm -mm. Which fit attributes predict decision values should be, okay. So it's a possible to obtain the fitted values for each observation, which are numerical scores, okay, used to obtain the class values. Um, so these must be the decision values. Um, so now we can produce the ROC plot. Did we? Uh, and the SVM appears to be producing accurate predictions by increasing gamma, we can produce a more flexible fit and generate further improvements. So here we have our ROC curve. Um, so our false positive rate, our true positive rate. Here, so we can see, um, what is the red ROC plot? Increase gamma. Okay. Plot fitted data is the training data. Okay, and they added the red. Okay, so this is, yep. Okay, so we're actually looking at the ROC on the training data, um, comparing the fitted values to the true values, I believe here. Um, okay, so however, the ROC curves are all on the training data and we are uh, really more interested in the level of prediction accuracy on the test data. Uh, so we wanna come, Compute the ROC curves on the test with the model uh, with gamma equals two um, and it appears to provide the most accurate results. Um, so one thing that um, you probably would wanna check here is um, where they're getting their values for gamma from. Um, so maybe some cross-validation that we did earlier in, the, in this lab. Um, but again, we can see actually um, it's, uh, it is a fairly decent model um, because we have a pretty high true positive rate uh, with a pretty low false positive rate here. And then um, if we have the SVM with multiple classes, uh, if the response is a factor containing more than two levels, um, and then the SVM function will perform multi-class classification using the one versus one approach. We explore that setting here by generating a third class of observations. All right, so now we've got these green points in the center. Um, and so we can fit an SVM again using the radial kernel. Uh, and we just do some general choices to get a quick idea of what we're working with. So we do cost equals 10 um, and gamma equals one. 
And uh, okay, so then we can see here, um, we've got a total of three plus classifications. Um, and so we have our dark red here that contains a majority of the green points. We've got our light beige contains the majority of the black points and then everything else in orange um, would fall into the classification of being this red class. Okay, so then there's an application to gene expression data um, using the CON data set. Okay, the data set consists of expression measurements um, for 2,308 genes. Uh, the training and test sets consist of 63 and 20 observations respectively. Uh, we will use a support vector approach to predict cancer subtype using gene expression measurements. In this data set, there are a very large number of features relative to the number of observations. This suggests that we should use a linear kernel because the additional flexibility will result from um, using a polynomial or radial kernel. Mm -hmm. Right, is unnecessary. Um, again, just because uh, 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 predict cancer subtypes. Very large number of features. Okay. All right. Number of support vectors, there are four. And there are four classes in this case. You see that there are no training errors um, because there are a large number of variables relative to the number of observations. And it implies that it is easy to find hyperplanes that fully separate the classes. We are most interested not in the support vector classifier's performance on the training observations, but of course on the test observations. Um, so again, we have our test data and we can do our predictions here. And, um, and we can see that using cost 10 equals uh, on the two test sets error, but we can see that using cost equals 10 yields two test set errors on this data, um, which is like 10%, I guess, error there. because it's 20, 20 total observations. So yeah, this was, um, I think it was great. Obviously I have a lot of work to do. Um, uh, SVMs are something that I think are have a huge applicability. Um, and it's, but again, yeah, I, I feel like realistically, you know, random forest might be the way to go first. Um, and I'll go back to my video and stop share. Um, but yeah, I think this was um, a very great, again, it, you know, I, I'm, I think it was, um, yeah, it was really helpful. I really like this this particular lab as well. Um, of course, I'm super biased because you know, um, I get I get excited. <laughs> I'm a little little sad I couldn't give more time to it, but um, that's okay. And um, and I thank think, you. Yeah. And, and you were thank you in, for that. In, in a regular job, uh, Jenna. Uh, very good. In a regular job, have you have you worked with this type of uh, algorithm? Never have. So I personally, so typically I'm doing, yeah, things like logistic regression and, and uh, linear regressions. Right. Um, and, and also, and the other issue that I've never really done like too many multi-class um, classifications as well, because ultimately I always, there's always going to be, unless if it's like a perfectly designed experiment, which admittedly I might have more access to nowadays, but before for the last, um, number of years, I mean, we had extremely unbalanced classes. And so it just takes a lot of work in order to make sure that you're, you know, creating um, a classification that can actually take into account that you have a variant that's maybe a 2% frequency. Um, and you're trying to find, you know, the particular like features, gene features that would identify this 2%, you know, frequent variant. And it's, and then it's like, if you, um, uh, you know, simulate like extra data, right? 
so you try to like right. increase it then i feel like you're really overfitting um because you're just got you know you've got like oh i have 40 samples out of 2000 like let's <laughs> let's mm -hmm. see how we can uh identify these and so ultimately it, it never really became um super tractable i mean i think it could be but um but i think there was a lot of uh concern that it would just be increasing so much bias um with the results that you would get that it's like well, let's, let's not <laughs> But, um, but I think it would actually be a really cool hackathon. Um, I'm not gonna lie, like, I, I, you know what I mean? Like, um, because there are so many rare diseases and rare variants. Um, and so it's a very like, in, in like, you know, if you're working with like cancer data. Um, and so I think it could be a very cool like idea to like actually take the time and, and figure out the best approach um, on how to do a multi-class classification with such, right. such rare variants. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's difficult sometimes to find the 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 margin, the correct margin that divides the groups correctly. So it's easily one some points can just be included in one class instead of the other. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's very difficult things and it's, it's a guessing game. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of the issue too, is like in all of these examples, like the misclassification rate was like 15%. Um, so like, I, I mean, at the end of the day, like an accuracy right. of 85% isn't necessarily good enough. Um, and I mean, I get that this is simulated data, but um but yeah, I think it's a really cool concept and I think it's absolutely applicable, but yeah, like the idea of misclassifying a person <laughs> or, you know, right. it becomes yeah. to the point where it's like, oh, is that, is that okay, yeah. you know? Um, and also, so that's also uh, yeah. in, in the confusion matrix uh, regarding yeah. the errors that, for example, in business, it's not the same, for example, uh, if you are doing a customer churn uh, mm -hmm. prediction, you know, if the, the let's say a bank, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the probability of a person, right? Your customer uh, leaving the bank, right? The, in terms of, uh, you know, how much money he had deposited and he takes it out, whatever, or investments, et cetera. Yeah. So it's not the same cost of, you predicting that a person is going to leave and he stays than if you predict that he's going to stay and he leaves, okay? Two different kind of errors, yeah. the false yeah. positive, the true positive, mm -hmm. but they have different costs, yeah. okay? And sometimes you have to, uh, you know, take that in consideration in terms of what type of error you want to minimize in that confusion matrix. Okay. For example, in, 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 that, in that particular scenario, I want to minimize my misclassifications in terms of the one that I predicted to stay and they leave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that costs me more than if I predict that they're going to leave and they stay. <laughs> yeah. That's a great point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Overdraft so, the so, bank. So it's, you... <laughs> it's, very, it, it's very related to domain knowledge. Yeah. Really. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, if a person that you diagnose, you know, is going to have a, a probability of uh, getting a terminal disease, what is the cost for you in terms of if you miss the prediction that is going to, you know, is, is going to get disease or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, how, how much does it cost to the, to the, to the, you know, to the, to the provider, right? To the provider. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that, that's one yeah. of the things that we have to really also manage yeah. because sometimes, you know, we, we kind of, uh, you know, focus on the diagonal of the accuracy, but the errors are the one that really you have to kind of, you yeah. know, uh, have, have in, your, in, in your watch because those are the ones that you really could uh, mess up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that was a yeah. great example. 
could it could cost your job too you know <laughs> if, if you're the ones you know that you're going to you know right. uh, as saying that you know you should go that way and that was the wrong way oops, uh -huh. oops. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's it's good for these models to have uh, an underneath uh, structure, which is uh, common to some phenomenon that you're analyzing. Uh, basically, uh, you know that you are analyzing some, some particular problems, so such as uh, rare disease and mm -hmm. everything. So you are dealing with outliers. Mm -hmm. so at the point, you, you know that uh, um, those, those values need to have some characteristics, uh, some uh, common elements. Uh, and so that you may be able to decide that those one will go together and the other ones not. But the problem is mm -hmm. when you have a low frequency of these elements, of course it's difficult, mm -hmm. completely different from having a large bank with, uh, uh, you know, like customers or, um, uh, so individuals, they have bank accounts and they are quite, most probably behaving all the same way. So you can easily classify them. Uh, this one will do that most probably. Uh, so the, the difficulty is, is uh, um, identify um, a model that will be able to, like, like in uh, uh, deep learning, Mm -hmm. So they, they have an underneath structure as well as the uh, for, for identifying uh, a phenomenon like the weather changes or everything. Mm -hmm. And you build up your model on, on this structure already well settled. When it comes to a phenomenon which is rare to appear, it's, it's, it's more difficult. But a uh, support vector machine would be very useful when you need to group things together. I think it's uh, uh, maybe something that would be uh, interesting to understand better is the kernel. Yeah. The things that uh, uh, is, is the key that which identify the structure of, of the, mm -hmm. the things that you are analyzing. Correct. Yeah, yeah that, that, the, the kernel is really the, if you go to tidy models, the kernel is really the engine, okay? That is running the, the, in this case, the support vector machine. So depending on what type of problem you have, the challenge is to try to uh, choose the right kernel, mm -hmm. okay? Because if your data is more linearly associated, maybe a linear will do it. But if it's not linear, then polynomial, kernel, you know, radios and, Oh, I think there are other other kinds of uh, kernels too there. I, I was thinking okay. on this purpose, if we you can <coughs> set a kernel, uh, which is, uh, you can decide for, for a different kernel. So they presented with like two, three types, linear, nonlinear, and but can you set your kernel? So for example, you have a particular uh, trend that you want to catch, which is uh, like a sort of, combination of polynomials or splines and everything uh, that you can set up as a kernel. So as an underneath structure that will work as an engine to classify the points. I don't know. So what I haven't looked into, and I feel like is kind of touching on what you're talking about, Federica, I think, um, is like, I would love to, yeah, like compare, like, okay, I have input data set. This is my training data set. Let's look at, um, compare the performance of the polynomial and the radial kernel. And like, and I feel like tidy models, have you ever heard of the tidy X screencast? I've, there's this one episode I have not yet gotten to, um, but it actually goes through how tidy models can go and like check, like it can basically go through like a very nice loop to do like the tuning and the, the model um, uh, cross validation across the different kernels so it should anyways, um, in order to actually select like what might be the best one for your data set. So it's not necessarily like you, I mean, obviously there's nothing to be discounted on saying like you as the analyst looking at your data, plotting it and deciding like, okay, I think that relationship is linear or non-linear, um, but it's quite nice to be able to not discount um, one of the kernels 
um, and be able to get more of a, an objective metric um, to say that was the best model. And then I'm, I'm going to check that. If if do you um, if you got the the link? Yeah, to the, um, to, to, I'll put it. It's a it's a YouTube channel, and then I think if you Slack. if you go to Tidy X YouTube. And then if you and then if you go to their playlist, there's one I think with there's one where they specifically go through um, like how to compare a, a large number of models to select the best one. Chat. Thank you.